the book of John, chapter number 3. John, chapter number 3. I need to uh, I need to make a public apology because I embarrassed the fire out of Joey and Slim last week. <laughs> I embarrassed them and I made them mad too. I thought my tires was going to be cut. Um, so it was not my point to embarrass. It was just my point to correct. So I'm <laughs> I'm glad we're friends, Joey, or at least we were, you know, can't speak for the rest of the day. John chapter number three, before we read the text, let's pray first and um, gear our hearts toward the word of God. Our heavenly father, Lord, we come to you today so thankful for everything that you've done. God, you've been better to us than we deserve. You've been better to us than, than even that we could have asked. God, I couldn't have dreamed to, to be able to have what you have given me. God, you've blessed us in all spiritual blessings through your dear son. So God, all we can do is say thank you. Lord, this morning as we get ready to read this text and embark on this journey through the text, I pray that you would help us. Give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, and minds to understand. God, may you help us see your word, and through your word, your son, clearer this morning. And Lord, while I am very thankful for, for Pastor's appreciation, or Pastor Appreciation Day, may we leave uh, loving Jesus more rather than loving the pastor more. God, may you help us this morning. We beg you, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's begin reading in verse number 1. John chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you. Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This morning, I want to preach on the subject religious but still rotten religious but still rotten in this passage in John chapter number three Jesus has a personal encounter 
with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. At the time of Christ, there was only about 6,000 Pharisees in the entire nation. Pharisees were the religious elite. Pharisees were the guardians of the law. Pharisees uh, were the ones that, that um, had given their life to the study of Scripture. They had studied the law and they have done their best to try to keep the law. The very name Pharisee means separatist. These guys with the best of intentions, I know the Pharisees get a bad rep, but the Pharisees with the best of intentions had separated themselves out to keep the law of God. The Pharisees were Israel's best. Nicodemus wasn't just a Pharisee, he was also a member of the ruling body of Pharisees which were called the Sanhedrin. This body consisted of 70 members, including the great high priest, uh, which would make it 71 to give them an odd number. They acted as the supreme court of Israel. They acted as that final judicial uh, group of people to help judge things in Israel. If Pharisee, if the Pharisees were the best, then the Sanhedrin were the best of the best. Well, the Bible also tells us in verse 10 that Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel. There's a definite article, the teacher of Israel. This was this was distinguishing Nicodemus out from the rest of the crowd. I mean, he's not just the best. He's not just the best of the best. He's the best of the best of the best. This is not a common guy. There was no one in the entire nation that knew the Old Testament writings the way that Nicodemus thought he knew the Old Testament writings. Nicodemus had wealth, he had fame, he had popularity, he had power, he had religion. Yet he came under the cover of darkness to Jesus because there was an emptiness. There was a void in his life. Something was missing and he knew it. We live in a world today where society tells us that joy can be achieved. That joy can be bought. Or if you work hard enough and long enough, you'll find happiness and fulfillment. Just like Nicodemus, men struggle to keep a set of moral ethics. They strive for wealth and fame, but they find themselves, just like Nicodemus, empty. Jeremiah 13, 22 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard change his spots? Then also you, how, how can you do good who are so accustomed to doing evil? People don't change because they work real hard at changing. You can still find yourself void, empty. Raising children has been the most uh, depressing, joyful experience of my life. At times, I am thrilled. And at other times, I want to kill them or kill myself. Like, it's just the nature of it. It's it's. It's difficult. There's times that I watch Melissa Abbott with her girls and I think I would never, ever, ever treat my girls the way. And then I find myself wanting to punch my girl in the nose. And I haven't seen Melissa do that yet, all right? 
But I find myself in this place. And I remember we were working through an issue with Rachel. And they don't like to be used as illustrations from the pulpit, but <clears throat> they'll get over it. We was working through her attitude. Man, I can deal with a lot of things as a parent. Man, I could you, could, you could probably burn the house down and I would be okay. But you sass your mother, I want to punch you in the throat. I, that's the way I am. If you lie to me, I mean, lying and attitude are the two biggest crimes in our house. Well, Rachel was working through some of that teen, you know, pre-teen, pre-adolescent, you know, attitude that just made me want to choke her. Um, and I remember it came to a head one day. Like it came, it came to an absolute head where I was frustrated, mama was frustrated, she was frustrated. Like it, it was at that point. And I said, Rachel, something has to change. And in tears, my daughter said, Dad, I've tried. I cannot change. She's right. Leopards can't change their spots. Ethiopians don't get to change their skin color. And teenage girls don't get to change their attitude. What we need is not more work and more reform and more turning over a new leaf. She needed something deeper. When Nicodemus came to where Jesus was, he greeted him with flattery and respect. Jesus never even recognized any of that. He comes with this great salutation. Oh, Jesus, we... Rabbi, we know that you are a wonderful man sent from God because nobody could do what you're doing. He was flattering him. He was giving him compliments. Jesus doesn't even recognize it. He cuts straight to the heart. In verse 3, he says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Imagine walking up to Jerry this morning. Jerry, I, I, I like your haircut. I, mean, I don't know who would say that, but Jerry, I like your haircut. I'm looking forward to the Sunday school lesson today. And Jerry just not even addressing anything you say and saying, you need a heart change. That's what Jesus did to Nicodemus. He cut straight to the heart. He cut straight to the problem. But you know why? Because this is the heart of the problem. At the heart of the problem is a problem with the heart. And we try to, we try to fix symptoms of things. Teenage girls' attitudes. Little boy lying. Spousal, a, a, a wife's rebellious attitude. All of it's wicked as hell. You might as well smile. Amen. All right. We try to we try to we, we try to do what our legislation does, and we try to legislate morality and push folks toward the law and deal with the symptoms and, and, and do all of this. But at the heart of the problem, there's a problem with the heart. Jesus said, You must be born again. Jesus never once talked about reform or religion. He didn't tell Nicodemus that he needed to join a church or be baptized. He, Jesus didn't tell Nicodemus to continue keeping the law and hope that he would earn his way. Nor did he lead him in a sinner's prayer. Jesus struck at the very nature of salvation. And he said, you need to be changed. You must be born again. See, Nicodemus was religious, but he was still rotten. Let's look at this text this morning. Under, under three, three headings, I'll give them to you up front because I don't know that I'll have time for them all. 
first off, the mandate of the new birth. The mandate of the new birth. Secondly, the miracle of the new birth. And lastly, if we have time, we will look at the means of the new birth. But first, let's talk about this mandate. Look at verse 3. Jesus answered him. Nicodemus didn't even ask a question. Jesus got all the answers. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Look at verse 7. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Jesus says that this is a must. It is a mandate. It is a necessity. It is an essential. Jesus' reply to Nicodemus shatters the Jewish, the Jewish assumptions that their racial identity or to what family they were born assured them a place in God's kingdom. Jesus made it plain that a man's first birth does not assure him of salvation or the kingdom, but it would take some kind of second birth. Most Jews of that time, they, they looked for the Messiah to bring in a new world in which Israel and the people would be preeminent. This Messiah who would set up his earthly reign and all of the world would look to Israel as preeminent. But Jesus came not to make Israel preeminent, but to make himself preeminent. Jesus was emphatic in saying that man does not need a reformation. Man does not need a reform or some kind of turning over a new leaf. Man doesn't even uh, need rehabilitation. But man needs radical transformation. You must be born again. Why is this a must? Why is this so important? Well, because of the nature of humanity... And the nature of heaven makes it a mandate. See, Nicodemus was a rich man. He was a wealthy man. Nicodemus was uh, a tradition and Jewish history tells us that Nicodemus was one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. He had more money than he knew what to do with. He had wealth. On top of wealth. On top of wealth. He had all the money. But what we have does not change what we are. He was rich, but he was still rotten. Nicodemus was a respectable man. When he walked down the streets, people knew who he was. They pointed him out to, to their children. He was held in great esteem. He was respected by all who knew and saw him. He was, after all, the teacher of Israel. This is the best of the best of the best. He was the moral example. He was the ethical man, so to speak. He was respectable. But it does not matter what we achieve. It does not change what we are. He may have been respectable, but he was still rotten. Nicodemus was a religious man. He was a Pharisee. He kept the law. He had dedicated his life to keep the law. He was morally pure to a degree that you and I couldn't even measure up to. Even Jesus recognized the religious efforts of these men in Matthew 20. He paid his tithes. He gave to the temple. He did everything that the law said to do. 
He kept the written law. He kept the law of traditions of the elders. He, I mean, he wouldn't even come in contact with a sinner. He would walk on the other side of the street. He was a holy man. But listen to me. It does not matter what we do. It still doesn't change what we are. He was religious, but, but he was still rotten. He was a sinner. He thought because his mom and daddy birthed him into a good family. He thought because his racial identity had found him, you know, had placed him in this nation of Israel. He thought because that, that he kept the law and because he did these things and because he gave to the temple. He thought that all of these things would affect it. But Jesus said, no. Congratulations, Nicodemus. None of those things matter. You must be born again. Why? What's the big deal, preacher? Nicodemus was a teacher of the Old Testament. He should have known Psalm 51.5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We look at babies and say, man, what a little sweet, innocent baby. He says that I was brought forth in iniquity. I, I was shapen in iniquity. I was born in sin. He says in Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth. My sister-in-law, I've told y'all this before. She looks at kids and she said, oh, what a precious little sinner. Because it's the truth. We're born in sin. We're not born perfect. We're not born good. We're not, we're not good old boys and good old girls. We're, we don't have it all put together. And it did not matter what Nicodemus thought about himself. He was a sinner. He was a teacher of the Old Testament. He should have known this. He should have known the nature of humanity. Isaiah 64, 6 and 7. We have all become one. Like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. The ESV really does a good job of cleaning up that language for us English speaking people. Polluted garments speaks of bloody rags. Of feminine hygiene products in the old days. Everything good that you think that you can do amounts to a pile of filth. That's what he says. He tells Nicodemus, I know you think you're a good old boy, but you ain't good at all. And it could be that even us, we, we look at our deeds and we look at what we want to do. We look at how we live and what we've achieved and the money that we have and the respect that we have and, 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 and how people think about us and how people treat us. Listen to me. None of that stuff matters in eternity. You must be born again. The nature of humanity, the nature of God demands us to be born again. Psalm 5 verses 4 and 6. Well, God just loves everybody. He's okay. I'm okay. We're all going to sit around, smoke dope, and be okay together. That's, that's not how it works. This is what he says, Psalm 5, 4 through 6. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. You're not. He, he, he's not a God who delights in wickedness. 
evil may not dwell with him. The boastful, you all know what boastful is, prideful. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. We, we like to think God loves, God hates the sin and loves the sinner. This is what he says in Psalm 5, 5. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors. That's a strong word for hate. He abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. You know where we failed? You know where we messed up? We've treated sin as if it's a cute puppy to be coddled. We've treated pride like it's okay, like it's, it's not that bad. We've treated our sin as if it's some, something that could be overlooked because God, it really doesn't bother God that much. That God is in the end going to take us all to heaven, ain't He? No, He says unless you're born again, you won't even see the kingdom of God. The nature of humanity, the nature of God demands that we be born again. Imagine the complete disappointment of Nicodemus at this point. He had lived his life up until this moment trying to keep all them laws, thought that he was good enough. And Jesus said, yeah, as a matter of fact, you're not even close. Some of y'all have grown up in church, been around church, you've been members, you've you're done all of these great things. But none of it's good enough. You must be born again. Not only the mandate of the new birth, look at the miracle of the new birth. Look at verse 4. Jesus said to him, how can a man, or, or Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He said, all right, how does this work? Verses 5 and 6, Jesus answered him, Truly, 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 I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus speaks about two births here. This first birth is our natural birth. This birth that is of the flesh speaks of the day that you entered into this world. That's wonderful. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But he also speaks about another birth, a second birth. <coughs> this birth, <coughs> this birth that is not of the flesh, but it's of the water and the spirit. Our first birth brought us into this world. Our second birth brings us to God. This is a miraculous thing. Look at verse number 8. He says the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound. TJ. Move up a pew. He says in verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound. But you do not know where it comes from. Or where it goes. So it is with everyone. One of the stupidest things I've ever said in the pulpit here was not Joey stop talking. It was actually, I, I made the comment, have you ever noticed the wind? Like I was given an illustration about something and it was going to be about the wind. But when I said that, y'all laughed at me. Like the entire church. And, and Slim said, you realize you're in Oklahoma, right? But I'll tell you, I'll ask the question, the dumb question again. Have you ever noticed the wind? <laughs> you don't know where it comes from. It blows where it wants to. 
this is the idea, this is the illustration that Jesus gives Nicodemus. It blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from. And you do not know where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus' idea here to Nicodemus was, you don't understand everything about the wind, but you can see its effects. That's how it is with salvation. You don't understand everything about salvation, but you know when it takes effect. The Spirit blows where He wishes. Or He dispenses His influence where and when and on whom and in what measure and what degree He pleases. You you know what this is saying? The Spirit of God does uh, is not controlled by man. There is an entire uh, denominational movement that thinks that they can call God to do things. That they can control Him, wield His power, and use Him for their own personal good. That's not how God works. Jesus' idea is that the wind blows where it wants. The Spirit, listen to me, the Spirit in regeneration works arbitrarily. It works as a free agent. The wind blows where it wishes for us. And it does not attend to our order, nor is it subject to our command. But God directs it, fulfills His word, Psalm 148.8. The Spirit dispenses His influence where and when and on whom and by what measure He pleases as He pleases. The Spirit also works powerfully and with evident effects. He says you hear its sound. Its causes may be hidden, but its effects are manifested. You don't know where it's coming from, but you see what it's doing. When the soul is brought to mourn over sin, when you are crushed under the weight of your sin, God opens His eyes by, your, by His Spirit, and you see yourself before a holy God. You don't know how that happened, but you know it happened. It blow, you, you hear the sound. It also, the Spirit works mysteriously and in secret, hidden ways. Look at what he says. He says, you do not know where it comes from. You do not know where it goes. How it gathers and how it spreads. Its strength is a riddle. We try to shove God, uh, God and His Spirit into some kind of box that we can figure out. You don't have a box big enough to figure God out. This is a mysterious work. But listen to me. This is the greatest miracle of all. This is the greatest miracle of all. A miracle is the direct intervention of God into the affairs of man. By which he alters the natural laws and perform the supernatural. That's, that's what a miracle is. It is the direct intervention of God into the affairs of man. He alters the natural laws and performs the supernatural. The new birth is the greatest miracle of all. Greater than turning water into wine is when Jesus turns sinners into saints. Greater than the creation of the world itself is when Jesus, through His Spirit, makes us a new creation. Greater than raising Lazarus from the dead is when God 
raises men who were dead in their trespasses and sins and gives them new life. Greater than making the blind to see is when Jesus opens the sin-blinded eyes of a man and lets him see himself as God sees him. That blinded man can now see himself, can now see God. Natural man does not want God. Well, I've always wanted God. You're full of hell. You're lying. You ain't always wanted God. The Bible says that no man seeketh after God. You say, well, that's in Romans. Well, it's also in Psalm. It's also in 2 Chronicles. Deuteronomy speaks of it. In the beginning, when man fell in the garden, it was God coming looking after Adam. And it's been God on the hunt ever since. None of us have chased after God. None of us have went running after Him. But God, in His great mercy, has taken us who were aliens from God, enemies from God. We were running the other way, living like hell when God stopped us in our tracks, turned us around, made us a new creature. The miracle of the new birth is the greatest miracle. You want to see a great miracle? Look in the mirror. People look at Slim and say, my God, what happened to him? And Slim doesn't get to take credit. People have asked him, you know, what would you do? What's the secret? How do I get in on that? And Slim doesn't get to take credit. Slim doesn't get to say, I turned my life around. Slim doesn't get to say, I fixed it. I made my mama proud. I started doing this. I started doing that. No. One day, God, through his spirit, worked on Slim's heart. Convicted him. For the first time in his life, he saw that it wasn't just church membership or baptism or anything else. He saw that he was a lost, hell-bound sinner. And Slim believed. But even he don't get to take credit for that. Faith is a gift of God. So at the end of it, Slim simply says... Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. This is a miracle. The text I read in our call to worship, Ezekiel 36. Listen to a couple of these verses. This is what God says. I will sprinkle clean water. Who's sprinkling clean water? God. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from your uncleanness and from all of your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Don't miss this. Salvation, the new birth, is a miracle. The way Jesus talks about this with with Nicodemus, he says you must be born again. He didn't say... That you must birth yourself. That just doesn't make sense. He said you must be born again. Something miraculous must happen. Listen to me. The message 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out to all who will hear it. But we do not get to play God to try to manipulate the emotions and try to act like the Spirit of God in people's lives. This is a miraculous event that only God can do. You must be born again. And he says the means, and I'm almost done. Look at verse number 9. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Let me tell you, after a conversation with Jesus, that would probably be my answer, my, my question too. How can these things be? Matter of fact, when God started working on my heart, that was my first question. How can these things be? Nicodemus has had his entire worldview shattered in just one conversation. We're only in verse 9, so we don't even know how long this conversation was. But boom, his worldview is shattered. He spent his entire life thinking that he could control his eternal destination. And then he has a conversation with Jesus and he's like, well, crap, I can't control it at all. He shattered. Nicodemus wanted to know how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? <laughs> can, can we just stop and appreciate the divine sarcasm of Christ? Aren't you? What he's basically saying, are, are you, I mean, you realize you're the teacher, right? And you want me to teach you, but you the teacher. And you're not just a teacher, but you the teacher. Of, yeah, this is sarcasm in full swing. Look at verse number 11. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not, here it is, receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not, here it is, do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus tells him that the root of the problem is belief. He didn't believe. He didn't trust. He didn't believe. He didn't have faith. If you remember last week at the end of chapter number 2. Do you remember at the end of chapter number 2 where the Bible says that there were many that believed. But Jesus on his part didn't believe in them. He didn't trust them because they weren't really trusting that theirs was a shallow, superficial faith. It's amazing how Jesus tells us that truth and then right after that we get to see that truth. Nicodemus was one of those who saw the great things, who was uh, inquisitive about what's going on, who was interested in the happenings, who was riding the emotional high, but he did not really believe. This is the problem. Belief. Jesus tells Nicodemus that the Savior's part in the new birth was to leave heaven, to come to this world and die for sin. Jesus tells Nicodemus that, that, that his part was to come to be lifted up. Like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. You know what I'm talking about? In Numbers chapter number 21 verses number 4 and 9. The 4 through 9. The people sinned 
against God. And so God sent serpents out into the multitude of people. They bit everyone. And God told Moses to take a snake, a brass snake, and put it on a pole and hold it up. And whoever looked and whoever looked at it would live. So the message was simple. Look and live. Behold your Savior. Trust in Him who has done everything. That is what Jesus points to. Knowing that Nicodemus was again the teacher, he says, you remember that? That's what I came to do. That's what I came to do. I came to be placed as a curse on a tree. He left heaven. Royalty. Stepped into depravity. The God of heaven, who was perfect, took on human flesh. Was born of a virgin. A helpless little baby. Was raised on the backside of the nowhere. In a town that was so insignificant that later on in life, they would say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? A nobody, not a political hero, not a, a, a kingdom builder, but, but, but this God man, this servant man, this perfect man lived a life fulfilling the law that you and I break every single day. Perfect. He did that. And then he laid his life down. They didn't kill him regardless of what Bill O'Reilly says. They didn't kill him. They didn't take his life from him. He said, no man can take my life. But I lay it down of my own accord. And if I lay it down, I can pick it up. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was mocked. He had a crown of thorns placed upon his head. He was nailed to a cross, hung up for the whole world to see. Isaiah said that he was so badly beaten that he wasn't even recognizable as a man. His bones exposed as he gasped for breath, paying for our sin debt. Jesus was doing his part. And then on top of all of the physical trauma, on him was laid our sins. Everything that we had ever done, everything that we were doing, and everything that we would ever do. The sin debt was placed on him. My sin, your sin, the sin of this world was Placed upon Him. And in that moment, as the earth grew dark, He looked up and cried, My God, my God, why have, have you forsaken me? He took it all on Him. And then He said, It is finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. Oh, He would have much more to do. But the tetelestai, the, the work of salvation, the work of redemption was paid for. It was done. Man, I didn't feel like I didn't feel like two dollars this morning. I wasn't ready to preach, but I'm feeling better and better the more I talk about this. He paid it all. Bless his name. And then he hung up his head, he hung his head and gave up the ghost. I know many of us would think that's the end of the story. But there was a man, <laughs> there was a man named Joseph. And then there was another man beside of him who had been so transformed by the message of the gospel that he couldn't help himself. The disciples had deserted 
and all the multitudes had crept away. But there was Joseph and Nicodemus. They placed him in a tomb. Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of spices and myrrh. That was enough for royalty. Something happened to old Nicodemus. Something got a hold of him somewhere along the way. 75 pounds. He, he placed it. He placed Jesus in the tomb with those spices, with those grave clothes. The big stone was rolled over. But Sunday was coming. And on that third day, by his own power, by the power of God and by the power of the Spirit. It's almost like the Trinity was involved in our redemption. God raised himself from the dead. Proving that he was who he said he was. And he could do what he said he could do. He ascended into the Father. He's sitting up in heaven right now where he's praying for you. He's making intercession. That's a big word that means he's praying for you. He's going to God on your behalf. Bless his name. Hallelujah. Glory. For preachers to get up and say, that, that Jesus meets us halfway. You just got to walk the other half. Do you not realize what Christ done? He came to me. He didn't come halfway. He came to me. He didn't come part of the way. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. I was running the other way. I needed a new birth. I desperately needed a new birth. I was on my way to hell. But God, through His Spirit, stopped me in my tracks, convicted me of my sin, opened my eyes to where I could see that I may have been religious, but just like Nicodemus, I was rotten to the core. He opened my eyes. Let me see God as He truly is. He let me see it. And all He said was, believe. This is not a superficial check a box, walk an aisle, pray a prayer, believe. No, because that is superficial belief. The Bible says that demons believe and even tremble. They're better than a lot of church folk. But it means giving him your whole life. What must the lost, hell-bound, good-for-nothing, rotten sinner do to be saved? Answers in verse 15. Believe. Because everyone who believes in Him, every single one that believes in Him has eternal life. The question for you is, do you believe in Him? He paid for it. He did the work. Do you believe Him? Are you saved? Because the free offer of the gospel is still on the table. He's still in the saving business. If you're not saved this morning, if you're miserable, fighting all of this, I mean, putting on all them religious little coats that y'all do, 
y'all, y'all realize that I spent like a, a lot of time in church before God saved me? Like, I, you know, I'd been baptized several times, Jerry. The church where I grew up, they had them gowns with the little rocks in the hems, you know, to keep it from floating up and showing everybody your stuff. I, I, I'd been baptized several times. But I was lost. Man, I had a godly grandmother. Had, I still have a godly grandmother. She gets so convicted and burdened about her sin that it puts me under conviction that I don't even think I know what sin is. She was talking to me the other day about, uh, about the sin of pride and, and, and getting aggravated at people because they're slow. I thought, good Lord, I'd like to introduce you to several of my people, but we don't know nothing about that. Got a godly grandmother. That don't do me a bit of good. My mother, she's not lived a perfect life, but she is a godly lady that loves God and loves me. That don't do me no good. Because God don't have any grandchildren. We had Awanas growing up. I was involved with children, with youth, with, with all that. I grew up in and around it. I knew what church was. But I will remind you, the Bible says that Judas betrayed Christ with a kiss. Judas was close enough to kiss the door of heaven and still die and go to hell. What about you? If you're lost this morning, you must be born again. If you're religious this morning, you must be born again. Miss Beverly, play something for us. Our Heavenly Father, God, this morning I pray that you'd work in our midst. God, I pray that you'd work on our hearts. I pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears. God, let us see ourselves as you see them. Would stop putting on fronts. Would stop putting on the show. Would God shun some pride. God, may you work in our midst. For it's in your name. Amen. Amen. You stand up.